Okay, so I'm going to be talking to you about brown tail moth. So first, I'm going to be covering uh, its history in Maine, its life history, um, as well as the human health impacts and how to mitigate them. Um, and then at the end of that, um, the other town is going to come up, and we're going to talk about management. So brown tail moth is an invasive moth. It's originally from Europe, so its native range is uh, in Europe, all the way down uh, through Spain, and also into part of North Africa. So it originally got here in 1897 in Massachusetts, and it came over on, uh, we think it came over on live plant material. Um, so Massachusetts in 1897, and then it's been established in Maine since 1904, so well over 100 years. And it's also closely related to gypsy moth. It has a wide range of hosts. It's not a very picky eater. Uh, its preferred hosts are oaks, apples, cherries, birches, elms, but in really high populations, it can also spill over to other hardwoods. So this year we've seen it in a lot of poplars and highly infested areas. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit about recognizing brown tail moth caterpillars. So in Maine, we have a, a lot of fuzzy caterpillars. So for brown tail moth, uh, it's the one all the way on the left. So it's gonna have it's always gonna have those two orange dots. And it's, it's gonna be like bright hunter orange. No other native caterpillar has that. Um, the two in the center, uh, eastern tent caterpillar and forest tent caterpillar. You're likely familiar with eastern tent caterpillar. It makes fairly large uh, web nests uh, in cherries on the side of the road. Um, both those e both eastern tent and forest tent are native, um, and then the Caterpillar all the way to the right is gypsy moth, closer related to brown tail. Um, gypsy moth was brought over here intentionally in 1869. There's a Frenchman, L.R. Uh, Trulaveau, that wanted to create American silk industry. Um, and he brought gypsy moth over here to try to interbreed it with some of our native silk moths. Um, they escaped his uh, <laughs> captivity and uh, running amok. The U.S. Forest Service annually spends $13 million each year trying to control gypsy moth. So a little bit about brown tail moth history. Like I said, it's been in Maine since 1904, well over 100 years. Uh, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with the winter webs. Winter webs are usually about the size of the palm of your hand, if not a little bit smaller. So that picture in the upper left-hand corner, that pile is composed entirely of winter webs. They used to pay a bounty to have school children go out and collect these webs. This is an excerpt from uh, Babe Gunnell's memoirs. Uh, she was a woman who grew up in Georgetown, turn of the century, uh, and an excerpt from her memoir, she talks about uh, brown tail moth in 1905, 1906. This is a woman, you know, 15 miles down the road, <coughs> writing about brown tail moth when it first became established in Maine um, and collecting them as a little girl. When brown tail moth first started becoming a problem, extensive control efforts were made. Uh, it's a little hard to believe now, but a lot of the Northeast was apple orchards. Apples were a, a huge industry, and they still are in a lot of the Northeast. So winter webs were clipped and burned by the tens of thousands, as you saw in those previous pictures. Uh, spray projects were initiated. There was a federal quarantine imposed. Um, a lot of people ended up cutting down their apple trees that got so bad. So that picture um, in the top corner, that's at a farm school, and they have the students going up and clipping up these winter webs as part of their <coughs> part of their schooling. Uh, the chart on the bottom is just a couple of things that they're using to spray in 1911. So uh, lime sulfur, arsenic and lead, pyrox, Bordeaux mixture, kerosene, tobacco, soap, Bordeaux lead, and something called bug death. <laughs> so a lot of these things. Uh, we don't spray anymore because we now know uh, the human health impacts as well as the ecological impacts. A huge biological program was initiated. So remember before when I was saying that brown tail moth and gypsy moth are closely related. So when gypsy moth um, was brought over in 1869 and it started getting out of control, they realized that it was going to be a really big problem. So they started bringing over a lot of um, parasitic flies and wasps from Europe, uh, gypsy moth's home range. The problem was that a lot of these were generalists and they didn't just attack gypsy moth, they also jumped hosts and attacked some of our um, native moths. So I don't know if any of you have ever seen a Cecropia moth, but they're very large moths. It's one of our largest native moths. It looks like a Persian carpet. It's red and 
and all that. They used to be very common. Uh, that fly in the uh, bottom right hand corner, uh, Comptolura consonata, um, that was one of the generalist predators that was brought over from ships and moths and started attacking our, our, native, ship, our native silk moths. Um, but there is a silver lining in that, is that later at the turn of the century when brown tail moth was introduced, um, a lot of those controls for gypsy moth also made the jump over and started controlling brown tail moth um, and utilizing that host. It's a little difficult to see, but this line is for that line. So that denotes 1914. So that was the, the largest extent that brown tail moth um, ever expanded in, in the Northeast. So 1914, you can see it's um, most of Maine, almost all of New Hampshire, half of Vermont, two thirds of Massachusetts, half of Connecticut, um, all of Rhode Island, and even a little bit down on the tip of Long Island there. So in 1914, you know, most of the Northeast. So there was a few outbreaks. So in the late teens, early 20s, the brown tail moth population collapsed. So it went from that furthest extent in 1914, um, to this dotted line right here, which denotes 1922. Uh, and then there was occasional um, outbreaks and population collapses over the next 60 plus years. Um, so the last major population collapse that we had was in the 1970s. And in the 1970s, um, it was retreated basically to the Castle Islands and parts of Cape Cod. And a lot of people ask me, uh, you know, if it was just on the Casco Islands, why didn't we go through and, and eradicate it? So it's sort of a false statement to say that it was only on the Casco Bay Islands, unless you checked every oak, apple, cherry, birch, everything like that on the mainland. It was just likely in subdetectable population level. So like I said, pop, huge population collapse in the late teens, early 20s. So we don't really know why that happened. Um, they didn't really take great records on on that event, but it was possibly due to a combination of Entomophaga alaki, which is a fungus that attacks brown tail moth. Um, that picture is a caterpillar that's infected with the fungus, um, as well as those generalist parasitoids, the flies and the wasps that I mentioned before. So this is the second part of the excerpt from Dave Gunnell. Uh, she's talking about that population collapse that occurred in the, the late teens, early 20s. Brown-tailed moths have these tiny hairs on them, so they're barbed hairs that are also hollow and contain a toxin. So not only are you getting mechanical irritation, but you're also getting um, that toxin injected um, into the skin. It's like a mini hypodermic needle. <laughs> the hairs are easily airborne. Um, they can settle on the grass, leaves, um, sheltered areas under your deck, under your um, boat trailer, stuff like that and they can become airborne again. I've heard stories of people shoveling snow in the winter and shoveling into a, <coughs> a pile of leaves and they had had a high brown tail moth population before and um, accidentally breathing in those hairs um, in the middle of the winter. So the toxin is very stable in the environment and it can last between one and three years um, and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't break down readily. The only thing that really breaks it down is high heat. So um, later on in the presentation, when we talk about management, burning the webs, uh, you don't really have to worry about you know the toxin uh, becoming airborne because it um, 
the heat will destroy the toxin. And um, if you're drying a long dry on the line, uh, high heat, drying it at high heat um, in a dryer before um, taking it in will also help destroy that toxin. So the secondary problem is tree damage. So uh, brown-tail moth isn't a huge forest pest. It's more of a human health nuisance. Um, so caterpillar feeding can cause branch dieback at about 30% defoliation. Um, and tree mortality only occurs after a few years. So this defoliation is compounded in the mid-coast region by another um, non-native moth called winter moth. Um, there's a few flyers over there about winter moth. So winter moth is another non-native moth that sort of has a similar life cycle. The caterpillars are active at the same time. So mid-April, mid late April, um, as soon as the leaves, or as soon as the buds start to burst, winter moth is gonna be on your oak trees as well as brown tail moth. So uh, these oaks that are on the coast are kind of getting hit three ways. They're getting hit by winter moth, they're getting hit by brown tail moth, and they're also getting hit by the uh, the two droughts that we've had the past couple of years. This is just a way to identify brown tail moth webs versus um, some of our other native web building caterpillars. Um, and the key difference here is always going to be size. So that's my hand. Um, so this is fall webworm, which is a native moth. Um, it's can be found in apple trees. It's, it's usually just a, a visual blight. They usually don't do too much damage to trees, or to apple mm -hmm. trees. Um, so that nest is about the size of a football. It's a very, very large nest. And as you can see, it's comprised mostly of silk, um, and it encompasses a large portion of the branch. Eastern tent caterpillar, you've probably seen this driving along the roads. Um, Eastern tent caterpillar is also native. Sometimes it gets into outbreak status, but since it evolved um, with its natural predators here, um, they keep it in check. So, with Eastern Tent, it's always also going to be another large nest about the size of a football, um, way larger than any brown tail moth nest is going to be. And it's also going to be almost always uh, basically where the branches meet the trunk. Um, it's a more secure location. So this is brown tail moth. So highly variable webs. I, this past winter I've seen webs that are almost exclusively silk and you can barely see any leaves in it. Um, and then you get stuff like this, which is sort of half silk and half, half leaves. So the key to brown tail moth, I, seeing brown tail moth webs, is that they're always going to be smaller. They're always going to be about the size of your fist or smaller. Um, and they're always going to be at the branch tips of the new growth. So what they do is they communally build this web at the end of summer, and they basically <coughs> silk, uh, they bend over leaves on the edge of the branch and silk them up and make and wrap them in silk and, and make a silken tent for themselves. So. Small webs, branch tips, um, composed of leaves and silk. So now we'll get into the life cycle of brown tail moth. So we'll start at what stage that they are now. So right now they're in their winter webs. Um, they'll probably be emerging in the next couple of weeks um, once it gets up into the 50s pretty reliably. Um, so they can, so on the bottom here when it says instar, so instar just refers to a stage in an insect's life. So when it hatches out of an egg, it's a first instar. When it molts its skin and grows into a large caterpillar, then it's a second instar, and so on and so forth. So there can be as many as seven or eight instars. So right now they're in third instar, so they're pretty small caterpillars, about the size of a, a sprinkle, basically. Um, but when they're they're bigger, they can be, you know, three, four inches in length. Uh, so in each one of these webs, there's between 25 and 400 caterpillars in each each one of these webs. Um, very familiar sight for most people. So in mid to late winter, when all the leaves are off the oak trees, and you see um, leaves hanging on or uh, shiny silken nests up on top of the trees, that's almost always going to be brown tail moth. So on um, sunny winter days, with the sun to your back and you're looking at them, they'll actually shine. And that brand new silk is what's shining and reflecting back. Um, and that's a good indication that it's uh, brown tail moth. Also, just noting that it's on the, the tip of the branches. So this is a winter web that I brought in to the lab um, for a couple of weeks in the middle of winter. And this is how many caterpillars are in one web. So if you are able, I know a lot of these webs are way up in the top of the trees, but if you are able to clip them out, you're saving yourself a lot of effort, even 
one, every web counts. So you take one web out, you're taking out a few hundred caterpillars um, that won't be turning into large caterpillars with, with toxic carriers. Mid, late April, uh, when it gets warm, the caterpillars are gonna start emerging. The picture on the right, there's a small caterpillar, um, and you can see the buds, they have those black dark holes. So that's where they go and they mine the buds before the, just as the buds are starting to burst, before the leaves have really opened up. Um, they're out, they're active, and they're feeding. Um, and they'll feed on the foliage until uh, about late June. Um, and they'll, like I said, they'll mow uh, five to eight times. So they'll be a pretty large caterpillar at the end of it. Um, and those top, so not only do the mature caterpillars have toxic carriers, but also um, the caskins, each time they shed to grow larger, those caskins have the toxic carriers on them. So at that size, they also have the carriers at that size already? Yeah, so, so all the stages, but as you as the caterpillar gets larger, it has more of the hairs, and they're also more toxic. So then in late June, early July, these large mature caterpillars are going to start um, moving around. They're basically looking for a place to pupate, a uh, nice sheltered place to pupate. So um, also they choose under the eaves of people's houses, but also boat trailers, RVs, cars, um, and that's one way that they move. Um, Mature caterpillars and also um, pupil cocoons. If, it, if there's a top of the tree is down, do they drop down as they as they grow as caterpillars, or do they have to do their whole life cycle? Um, um, no, as they feed and they run out of the, um, foliage and they get bigger and they require more foliage, they kind of work their way down the trees. Um, so again, these cocoons are are full of toxic carriers. So often they'll pupate right on the tree and the leaves. And then the adult moths uh, emerge from the cocoons in July and are active um, into August. So that's the reason why it's called brown tail moth, is the abdomen is covered in um, brown hairs. Those are not the toxic hairs. Um, you, don't really, you don't have to worry about the adults um, with the toxic hairs. Occasionally, as they're coming out of that pupil cocoon, they'll maybe pick up a few toxic hairs, but those brown hairs on the abdomen are not those toxic hairs that you have to worry about. Uh, so the adult moths are attracted to lights, and they have a peak activity between uh, 10 p.m. and midnight, and it's heavily weighted towards males. So a lot of people tell me that they got the shot back out, and they're vacuuming up all the moths around their lights, um, and that's not really doing a whole lot for the population. It's definitely making people feel good, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately for us guys, we don't really matter too much biologically. It only takes a few females um, that are fertilized to to keep the population numbers up. Mid to late July, early August, um, the eggs will be deposited on the leaves of the host tree, so oak, apple, cherry, um, birch. <coughs> and there's, in each one of these uh, egg masses, there's between two and 400 eggs. And I don't know if you can make it out, but the, you can see the little tiny baby caterpillars um, hatching out and, and moving away from the egg mass. Um, so the female will cover the egg mass with those hairs from her abdomen. Again, not the toxic hairs they have to worry about. And they prefer they prefer trees that weren't defoliated the previous spring. But in areas of high infestation, they will um, go back and, and go back on those same trees that were defoliated in the spring. So the eggs are going to um, hatch in August. So as these, when these caterpillars hatch in August, um, they're going to feed communally. And they're not necessarily defoliating the leaves, they're skeletonizing them. So they're basically eating the top layer off the leaves, um, which is that picture on the right. You can see those little baby caterpillars. Dark green uh, leaf surface is the natural leaf surface, and they're just basically grazing that right away. Um, also, in, in August, they're going to start building that winter web, and it's a communal effort between those 25 to 400 caterpillars. So this is basically just a summary of the life cycle. Uh, so the takeaway home message here is the highest risk for exposure to hairs is between end of April uh, through July. And the, the life stages to worry about are uh, the caterpillars. Mature caterpillars have the most toxic hairs, uh, cast skins um, on the trees and around the trees, um, as well as those people cocoons have a bunch of those toxic hairs in them. Uh, so the current situation in Maine right now is we've seen a uh, market increase in the population since 2015. 
Bradshaw moth has been found in 12 out of Maine's 16 counties. That doesn't mean that we have established populations there. It just means that we we have light traps all over the state. We that's a survey for defoliators, and occasionally we'll pick up an adult brown tail moth in one of those light traps. Um, so it doesn't mean that there's an established population in all those 12. So we do aerial surveys in the fall and the spring to pick up defoliation. Um, so we usually fly in late spring, early summer uh, to pick up defoliation from the mature caterpillars. And then we fly again in October, uh, September, October to pick up the defoliation from those little tiny caterpillars that are skeleton skeletonized in the leaves. So this is the risk map for 2018. This is gonna be updated hopefully later this month. Uh, we're completing some of our winter web surveys. Uh, so things that are probably going to change in 2019, a lot of those yellow islands in the center of that, uh, in the center of that blob are going to be coming uh, orange, which is classified as moderate. And a lot of these, um, a lot of these uh, orange blocks on the, uh, on the border that, um, on the high infestation, those are going to probably become red as well. Uh, so this is our aerial defoliation uh, that we mapped last year, so 126,000 acres of defoliation. That blue line denotes the extent that we found winter webs. Um, that is also going to change in 2019 because we found winter webs um, up in Crawford, which is uh, near the Canadian border, uh, as well as some other sites a little further north. Take home message, so in 2003, um, there was a little less than 11,000 acres. So compare that to 126,000 acres from just 2018. So as you can see in 2015, um, there's been a, a steady increase in the population and a couple of reasons for that might be um, drought. So the drought that we've had the past couple of summers um, helps brown tail moth. So that fungus that I was talking about before um, doesn't survive and doesn't spread well when it's hot and dry. Um, we need cool, wet springs, so cool, wet Mays and cool, wet Junes um, will help the brown tail moth population. In the summer, <coughs> during that activity period, you're going to try to want to not park um, underneath ornamental trees or trees that can serve as a host for brown tail moth. Um, so mature caterpillars can hitch rides on your car, uh, cocoons, and sometimes adult moths. Um, so those are the three mobile life stages. At the top of the map, there's uh, three red stars. So those are populations that are away from the main bulk of the population. And each one of those um, locations is anecdotally tied to uh, people that have vacation homes on the coast, and they unknowingly bring brown tail moth um, with them back to their, their primary residence. Um, so boats, vehicles, trailers, all of those can be affected. This was a picture taken just this past winter um, when we were out doing surveys. This was a population that was way outside the, the normal bulk of the population. Uh, in that red circle up there, there's five uh, brown tail moth winter webs, and we were curious about how they got there. Um, well, if you look in the bottom uh, left hand corner, there's a camper. So, what likely happened is that these people. Or down on the coast, uh, camping out in a heavily infested brown tail moth site, and accidentally brought either cocoons or mature caterpillars back home with them and started one of these little satellite populations. Obviously, you're going to want to try to avoid exposure to hares um, and avoid places that are heavily infested with caterpillars if you know they're <coughs> very sensitive. Um, so, this bottom bullet point, what a lot of people forget is that if you're in a heavily infested brown tail moth, um, area you're going to want to dry your laundry inside if possible. Um, believe me, I am a huge fan of line dried laundry and it's one of the best parts of summer. Um, but it might save you some, some headaches if you dry your laundry inside. Um, if you think that your laundry in the line has, has may have come in contact with some of these airborne hairs, um, what you can do is take the laundry inside, put it in your dryer, turn it on at the highest heat it can go for about 10 minutes and that high heat will help um, destroy the to that to toxin in them. Um, you're still gonna have bar pairs in there, but it's, it's gonna be better than bar pairs and the toxin. You're gonna wanna use caution when you're cleaning up debris um, left by brown tail moth. So um, pupa on the side of your house, 
or uh, leaves underneath a tree that has a lot of brown cell moth in it. Uh, you're going to want to, if you can, you're going to want to take a garden hose and wet down um, the area that you're working at if you don't have brown cell moth in it. And that'll help keep the hairs um, close to the ground. Coveralls, respirator goggles, poison ivy oils I'll get in, but also so that brown cell moth hairs don't stick into you. You can get them at um, any outdoor store. I know, so the Tech New is one of the brands, but any any poison ivy way. You're gonna to wanna to try to, if you're in a heavily infested area, you're gonna to wanna to try to work on wet days. I know it sucks mowing your lawn uh, when the lawn's wet, but um, it'll help you from breathing in those areas, uh, for breathing in those areas. And if you are vacuuming um, caterpillars or people's tombs off the side of your house, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that shop pack has a HEPA, HEPA filter on it, because otherwise you're just gonna take those hairs, pulling those hairs out and make them hairs work. Um, a lot of people ask me, you know, it was really cold this winter, is that going to affect brown cell moth uh, survivability? And the quick answer to that is cold temperatures do not affect brown cell moth. So brown cell moth is um, native to an uh, area in Europe that is at the same latitude that we are. So for the most part, with some exceptions of uh, geography, if you're at the same latitude, those places are experiencing the same climate to the mo to, for the most part. Um, so a lot of these species from Europe and Asia that are at the same latitudes that we're at, they're already adapted to our coldest winters and our hottest summers, um, so they're, they're well suited to, to invade. Uh, one thing that can help is cool wet springs, so cool wet mains, cool wet junes. Um, so that does two things. So when it's cold, uh, caterpillars aren't out feeding as much. They do come out to feed, but mostly they go back and they huddle in that winter web and it's just like humans, when it's cold out, we all huddle inside and we you know, spread colds and flus and all that. So colds and flus with humans, um, that fungus with uh, brown tail. When they go out and they do feed, they pick up some of those spores, they come back and they transmit them uh, between each other. And also that, that wetness helps the fungus uh, grow and sporulate and, and spread. When I was mentioning uh, winter webs, so this is sort of a little bit late. We usually try to have these presentations in the fall, winter, early spring, so that people, if there are webs that they can clip by hand, they can go out and clip them. Um, so if you are gonna prune webs, you're gonna wanna prune them before mid-April. Um, after mid-April, the caterpillars are gonna start emerging and, and clipping them won't really do too much, uh, too much of anything. When you do uh, clip them, you're going to want to burn them or soak them in soapy water. So the reason why we say soapy water is to that web is hydrophobic, so it repels water, and that detergent is going to help destroy that hydro hydrophobic layer and let the water in and, and drown. So we usually recommend that if you were so the hair activity is pretty low well in the winter. We recommend that if you are sensitive, you know you're sensitive, you're. It's never going to hurt to, to take all the, the precautions that you can. So also destroy the webs if you're clipping them out. If you clip them out and they just go on the ground, those caterpillars are going to come out and they're going to find the tree and climb right back up. They're very good at that. Does anybody have any questions about the history, life cycle, any of that? I thought that I read somewhere that at one point they did aerial spray. <coughs> they did. With the fish, what happened with that, or was it effective? Or? Well, so they used to do that in like 50s, 60s, 70s, and before that. Um, so one of the things that happened was that our funding got cut. So in the early 2000s, we lost two entomologist positions. And then uh, five years ago, we lost a, another tech position. So we're spread pretty thin. Um, there's a lot of other stuff going on in Maine, like Emerald Ash Borer and Hemlock Lily Delgid and Winter Moth. And so we're a small group trying to, to spread ourselves out. Well, uh, this, the Brazilian Moth is still active in Europe, is that right? Yep, yeah, so in Europe, it, so there are uh, some colleagues in Europe that we um, talk to to see if there's anything that they found uh, that's effective. And for the most part in Europe, um, it's not really a, a huge problem. Um, occasionally it does have outbreaks, like in, in Spain, they just had an outbreak not too long ago, but it dies down. Um, so the outbreaks here typically last between six and seven years, uh, depending on the weather that we have. Um, so right now we're in year four of this outbreak. So 
she was just uh, noting that there was a fly um, that was um, taking advantage of a, um, one of these caterpillar, dead caterpillars. Um, so it's possible that the fly may have been um, just feed, feeding on the dead caterpillar. A lot of these flies that uh, uh, do help control the brown tail, they lay their eggs inside brown tail moth caterpillars, um, and then the, their larva basically eat the caterpillar from the inside out. They got very dry. Very dry? Yeah, they, they killed it. <clears throat> yeah, so it might have, they may have died from the fungus, um, and then the fly came in. So the question was, um, what's the difference between gypsy moth and winter moth? Gypsy moth is a fairly large caterpillar. I'm, I'm sorry, the brown tail is a Brown tail and gypsy moth. winter. Oh, brown tail in winter. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So winter moth is, uh, is not very closely related to these. So winter moth is, uh, it's like a little green inchworm. Uh, basically, it's not heavily defended at all, um, pretty small, and uh, that's going to be on oaks and maples in coastal Maine. So winter moths is, is found basically all the way from Kittery all the way up to Far Harbor. So the question is, uh, what are the effects of the hairs on pets? It can affect if it gets in their eyes or their nose. It can affect, um, you know, it, they can have a similar um, irritation. But as far as most of the, most of the body, um, their hair is pretty much going to keep those toxic hairs away from their skin. The problem arises when um, people go to, if their dog has been out rolling leaves and they come in and they pet their dog and have, have, have uh, brown tail moth hairs on it, they could pick them up and get you to. Uh, so the question is how long does the rash usually last? Um, so it varies on the person. I've heard um, hours all the way up to months. Um, a lot of people, especially this. Uh, more sensitive individuals um, have a longer suffering period. They could also be um, just picking up hairs throughout, throughout that uh, month-long period. When you're spraying to control brown tail moth, you're going to be spraying in you know late April, early May, and that's before monarchs have even started. Well, they just started their migration north, but they're nowhere near me. Um, also, a lot of our other native moths and caterpillars aren't active at the, at the time that winter moth and brown tail moth so you're missing a bunch of those because you're spraying early trying to get those young caterpillars, so you're missing a bunch of our natives. So do they spray with horticultural oil and insecticidal soap? I guess this might be a good segue to go yeah. into management. <laughs> you can do an uh, aerial foliar spray. We're precluded from doing that in some um, shoreland zoning areas. So uh, there is a, a soil drench you can also use and an injection. Um, the, the, the effective material is called acephate. A-C-E-P-H-A-T-E, -E -E, acephate. You have a small window of opportunity to, to apply this material. And once that window's closed, um, you really don't have that as an option. And you have to wait to um, another life stage. So um, the, the material you can use, uh, BT, BT is also another material you can spray on the, on the foliage and another um, Materials called Entrust, E N T R U S T. Uh, BT is a, a bacteria that you spray physically onto the leaves of the tree. Um, it eats, uh, the, the caterpillar eats it and dies from the inside out. I, I tend to shy away from um, the, the, foliar, the foliar spray or aerial spray just because of the, the, the amount of material that must be um, applied and um, because, because the window of opportunity uh, has varied. Two years ago, we had a two week window. And, if you, and because of the, uh, the way the spring was uh, coming on, temperatures, uh, rain and so forth, the window was very uh, short. And if you didn't get it in that time, you were, you were out of luck. Um, so if you're doing, if you're relying on something to come do a, a foliar spray, uh, you can't spray when the wind speeds are over 15 miles an hour. You have you have more limiting factors. So if that if you lose that day, you've lost that day. And you could do injections in any weather, um, and the injections work along the lines of uh, if you if you think about maple syrup right now, maples are are moving materials upward into the canopy. Um, the same thing is happening with oak. So the timing of the injections is to get that material into the vascular system of the tree and have it migrate up into the, the leaf canopy so that it's, it's actually in the leaf tissue when they emerge and start to eat. Um, so when do you do that? I'm sorry? When do you do that? When do you inject 
Um, I just uh, spent my afternoon doing that. Um, I, uh, I was at a talk last night in Yarmouth, and I talked with Whitney Tree and Noah Tucker from Bartlett and whatnot, and we're all, uh, uh, the, the window it has opened. So I'm, um, I've started my injections already. It, it should run, it, I, I'm guessing about a three week window right now. If they have not emerged yet. It's gonna take some warmer temperatures for them to emerge, but the tree itself has been active for several weeks and it's, it, it will migrate the material up and, and it will uh, become part of the leaf tissues. There are some over-the-counter um, materials. You still need to be very cautious with them. Cheryl Tree, S-H-E-R-R-I-L-L, tree.com. Uh, there's a product called Tree Tech. It's called Tree Tech Dendrix, and that's the acephate version. It's the same active ingredient as acephate. You can buy um, BT uh, as a consumer to, to spray in your trees. I suppose I should have brought one of the injectors. It's a, um, an 1164th drill bit. You drill it in, you, you, you insert it, you tap it in, and then it's a, a plunger that um, kind of puts a back pressure on it and it, it forces it into the vascular canvas. They're, they're ghost, so that um, if you do order the stuff, um, you need to know the circumference of the tree because there's a, one injector every six inches. So that's, that's how you dose your own tree. When I was City Arts and Bath, people would always ask, um, um, what should I do? And the, my, always my first question was, are you affected by it? Um, not everyone is. I don't get brown tail moth. I can roll on the stuff. I, I don't get poison ivy. I don't get poison sumac. I don't get poison oak. Um, and that's why dad always sent me up the tree in the apple orchard we grew up in. So it, if, if you don't get the rash or have a breathing in my leg, then you have no work. BT is not, it's a, it's a foliar spray. Um, and it, um, it will, it will uh, wash off with rain. In, in trust does not, um, uh, it, but it's, it, it is also a powerful um, caterpillar. Insecticide. Any of the any of the rosiaceae family <laughs> trees, hawthorns, apples, uh, those kinds, uh, birch. I've seen them on poplar, as we mentioned, um, oaks. Those are those are the main host tree. The I and I, I don't think it's been stressed enough. Um, uh, in the mid '90s, um, I was getting complaints from people in Bath, and they were complaining that their neighbor was going to be sued by them because they didn't have any oaks in their in their yard, but they were being impacted by the neighbor's oak trees. And I said, I'm really sorry, that's that's a that's a health issue and it's a neighbor issue. Um, but it, it 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 is considered a public health issue. At that time, uh, brown tail moth was not on anyone's radar of being a, a tree health issue. In combination with winter moth, I'm seeing very large mature oak trees um, die um, oak in the course of uh, three, four, five, six years. And that's a whole new ball game uh, because of the, the repeated defoliations, uh, the, the lack of moisture during the summer. Um, oaks can only take so many defoliations. I'm, I was down, uh, I don't know, I must be a curse. I was down when the eye of the storm of gypsy moth was down in Shelton, Connecticut. And you drive on roads, and it was just squish, squish, squish. Mm -hmm. Those trees had a longer growing season and a greater capacity to refoliate uh, and regenerate their canopy. Um, and there was there was sufficient rainfall during those seasons to, to accommodate that. We haven't had um, the same kind of rainfalls in the last several years. Um, so the 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 stress that is these trees are now under is is quite substantial. So. Um, the combination of winter moth and brown tail moth is, is a, a, a huge concern. Just brown tail moth is a public health issue, but between the two of them, now it's a tree issue and a health issue. The, the first place I go to search is the, the Forest Service has um, a, a website, and um, the, the State Arborist Licensing Bureau asks for all arborists, licensed arborists, that were willing to, to do brown tail moth mitigation. So there's a list on, on the state's website, and it's broken down by county, um, how far you'll travel, will you go certain heights, do you do spring? So you, you've got a, a, a good list to work from. Um, so that's, that's number one. Um, it, it's a good news, bad news story. Uh, unemployment in Maine is low, low, low. And you know what sucks? 
the unemployment rate is low, low, low. They're, the companies that do this work can't find the people to do the work. And, the, and the, I personally, I have taken between 10 and 15 calls a day for the last three weeks of, from folks like you saying, can you come help me? I'm, I am a one person business. I have spoken with Lucas Street, Bartlett, Davey, Asplund. They are booked solid. They're, they're like physicians now. It's like, I can't take on any new clients or, or customers. So you, you need to um, call as many as possible and, and go on that list. It's, it's, I, I, I'm sorry to say that. So you're, um, again, when I was city harvest, it was if you had a problem, you could do nothing or cut the tree down. Um, and I, I hate to sound crass, but removing the host is removing the host. Um, you, you no longer have that issue. It, it is, it is a, um, a strategy. Uh, in between that, you have uh, foliar sprays, you have the injections, you have soil drenches. There is a fall injection period when you can do a, a follow-up injection. What's nice about the fall injection is there is residual uh, carryover of the material into the springtime because it's not metabolized. The stuff that's done in the spring um, is incorporated into the leaf tissue and it's metabolized over the course of summer. So it, it doesn't have as long a carryover. So the, the fall injection is, is very effective and there's another foliar spray you can do in the fall. So it's, it's a number of things. And, and I, I don't know if I should say this or not, but I would not uh, recommend hiring people to go cut the nest out of the tree. I'm sure he's gonna give me a funny look, but to pay someone to go up 90 feet to get nests out of the ends of the tree, you're not gonna find anyone that's gonna do it. And those that are, there are companies up, up in the coast that are hiring a crane for a whole day to dangle someone to get those nests out. That's cost prohibitive. Um, there, there's better bang for the buck doing um, these, these other types of remediations. Lower, lower elevation stuff is reasonable to have someone remove nets. There's no silver bullet and there's no one treatment that's going to clean it all up. It's going to be an ongoing maintenance thing and it's also going to be um, finding out from the state what overwintering survival rates have been, uh, looking at the map to see how far it's spread. It's, it's a monitoring thing. So it's, it's also, and I, um, I, I, I feel for folks, um, I was, I think I was telling Tom or Bambi, but uh, I've had several clients call up and they bought their houses. They moved out of state four to five years ago. They, they bought this house and now they're having buyer's remorse. Why did I spend all this money to live in these conditions? So a lot of it is, and, and someone asked me the other day, what would you do if you lived here? I never answer that question. I don't live there. It's not my property. It's not my asset. It's not my quality of life. It's not where I live. So, it's you deciding. Um, would I would I treat my entire 30 acres? No, that's ludicrous. Um, I would be figuring out a fire break of where I want to enjoy my outdoor living area and treat that area. You're you're not going to eliminate it from your property. It's going to be reinfested. Even if your neighbors treated their tree, you're still going to be getting levels of reinfestation. So it's, it's deciding how much you want to invest in that, in that management and maintenance. And that's gonna, that's gonna vary from year to year based on you know, how long, um, how long that, that peak is. So I, there's no really good answer for it. There is a gentleman in Brunswick, and I'm drawing a blank on the company, but he's having two drones built uh, to do uh, aerial spraying by drone. There are certain materials you, uh, you, you, uh, you're precluded from spraying a lot of, uh, of those materials around water areas and within the shoreland zone, you're, there's some restrictions. So, um, like I said, they all have toxicities. Uh, that's why injections are good. The, the drone thing is going to be kind of a game changer in a, in a lot of regards. B, BT is a bacteria that's ingested and, and will kill from the inside out. I'm, I'm unsure about its effect on bees or other pollinators. I sort of called this meeting because about a month ago I, I, um, I got some nests and uh, didn't intend to, but I hatched them out. I just put them in a ball jar and two months later I had 400 caterpillars and then saw them in all the trees around my house.
motivated me to take this action that I did was um, at Juniper Hill School in Alma rented a man lift. You know, so it's a crane with a lift that goes up 55 feet. And it's got a platform for two people. And they were working with an apple tree and effectively cut out with one of these great pruners that I bought. Um, and so they got every single nest out of those apple trees. And I think that was worth it. It cost $200 to be able to run this lift. Um, but you can get a fair amount done. Um, for us, it didn't work because it turned out the trees were a lot taller than <laughs> So, um, and, and this also was very difficult because not only did it not reach it, but it swaying in the, in the wind with telescopes to go 10 feet up, but it, it was hard to actually grab it. But I think if you've got apple trees, it's probably worth doing that as, uh, as an effort. There are a lot of uh, pharmacies in the Midcoast. I think one of them is called the Midcoast Pharmacy. Um, and a lot of them have, have uh, remedies that are a mix of uh, you know, witch hazel, calamine, uh, and a bunch of other stuff. Some, some of them have steroids to uh, stop the swelling. Um, but if you basically go into any compounding pharmacy along the Midcoast, they'll have something. And I know uh, if you go to some of the grocery stores, right as you walk in or right near the pharmacy, they have a whole table just devoted to, to prime time and stuff. So there is anecdotal evidence of uh, even people that don't react reacting um, after successive uh, long-term exposure. Noah Bartlett at Bartlett True Care, um, he used to never react, um, and then he works in a heavily infested brown time moth area for two years, and then all of a sudden he started to get the rash. So <coughs> often it's the people with, um, you know, bare skin and all that that are the most affected. Um, and it is, it is sort of like a lot of other allergies is that, um, you can, the, it gets worse if you get re, um, repeated large exposures to these areas. There's three things I found mixed together that are most effective. It's witch hazel, benadryl, and hydrocortisone. And if you mix those three things together and make them into a little syrup and use a cotton ball, it's like the best on the planet. If, you, if you've already got it presently on the property, you, you probably want to at least try a spring injection um, and then wait and see what happens over summer. If, if it's really dry over summer and you have the ability to irrigate, uh, I, would, I would recommend irrigating. Um, they, they've done a lot of controlled studies about trees that are under stress and um, <laughs> They found that the most effective means of reducing stress in a tree that's under stress is just irrigation. Uh, trees, trees have really acute immune systems and can respond really well, but they, they have to be properly hydrated. Uh, there's, a, there's a summer dormancy. Um, photosynthesis is um, most efficient in the 70 degree temp range, and once you get into the summer, things just kind of change. Uh, but making sure it's properly irrigated can go a really long way um, and it's going to be a monitoring th I, 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 I manage a lot of um, orchards organically the cornerstone of that is observation um, and, and degree days uh, knowing what pest you, you're going to be looking for so it's, it's really scouting and monitoring um, looking at the, the yearly stem growth on stuff um, th those kinds of things so what's the frequency it's it's knowing it's knowing your trees. Go out and go out and talk to your trees on a you know, yeah. weekly basis. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. And it's really it's monitoring them, and knowing them, and, and knowing how they react. There's no silver bullet, and there's no one treatment that's going to clean it all up. It's going to be an ongoing maintenance thing, and it's also going to be uh, finding out from the state what overwintering survival rates have been, uh, looking at the map to see how far it's spread. It's it's a monitoring thing.